A little while back, I asked all of you to share with me what your favourite classical test albums are when you listen to your gear. Whether it's speakers, devices, headphones, etc., I wanted to know what did you think made for a great test album in the classical genre. And so today I'm going to share with you my reactions to those suggestions. And I want to start off by saying a huge thanks to everybody that answered the survey and submitted their albums. I also want to say that please don't take offence if I don't personally find it to be a great test album, because sometimes the albums that we really enjoy could be a personal choice, there might be an emotional connection to the album, or it could be that it happens to sound fantastic on a particular set of gear that we have at the time, but then across other types of gear, maybe it doesn't stack up so well. So just because I don't like it doesn't mean you need to stop using it, it doesn't mean that it's a bad album. The intention of this video is to share my reactions and my feedback on it as I listen to it on my gear. That doesn't make my thoughts right or wrong, but hopefully it'll give you some food for thought when you're selecting other test albums, when you're considering whether to keep using these test albums, etc. Now, if you want to listen along, I can't play the music on the YouTube video because unfortunately not only will it block monetization, I don't care so much about that, but it will actually block the ability for some people in some locations to see this video. So I do have to mute the audio when I'm having a listen. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to skip past big chunks of it so you don't have to sit there and just watch me listening in silence. And if you do want to listen along, maybe check out the tracks as I'm starting to talk about them. I'll put a link down in the description below through to both Cobas and Tidal with all of the tracks so you can listen to them for yourself. Two final things before we get into the listening. The first is I want to say a huge thanks to channel sponsor Linsoul. It's thanks to Linsoul's support of the channel that I can produce videos like this. I don't have to focus only on product reviews. So I want to say a huge thanks to them for making this possible. And if you want to say thank you and also support the channel, there's a link in the description down below. Next time you're shopping for audio gear, whether it's headphones, earphones, DACs, amplifiers, etc., check out the link through to Linsoul, make a purchase there. It's a wonderful way to say thank you to them and I appreciate any and all support. The final thing now to talk about is the test setup. What I'm going to be running today to have a listen to these tracks is I'm running Rune as you can see on screen, and from Rune I'm then taking a feed out to the Eversolo DMPA6 streamer. That's a bit perfect stream. From there I'm taking a coaxial feed out of the DMPA6 into the Chord M scaler, from the Chord M scaler into the Chord TT2 DAC, from the DAC I then take a feed out and into the Enlium Amp 23R, and then I'm listening from the Amp 23R into the Focal Utopia 2022s. And straight away some of you might be wondering why I'm doing this on headphones, thinking that speakers would be better. And the answer for that is twofold. One of them is that I do most of my listening and reviewing with headphones, so that's where I'm most familiar. But also, this is actually the second time I've recorded this video. When I tried to do this yesterday, I had a major audio and video glitch. I've had to start again. And so that means that I've actually listened to the first half of these albums already. I wanted this to be kind of a first time reaction. Unfortunately, that video has gone in the bin. But as part of that testing, what I discovered was that what I was hearing from the headphones is exactly the same as what I heard from the speakers. I tried both. They both gave me the same results. And if anything, I think I can tell more from the headphones. And that's generally the case. What you can hear from a great setup through a great set of headphones will tell you exactly what you can expect from speakers. Now, obviously, speakers are able to produce a larger sense of soundstage and layering out in space, but you can still get all of that within a headphone soundstage. It's just closer to you and sometimes a bit inside the head. And so that's why I'm using headphones, but rest assured, it doesn't limit the insights I'm going to share about these albums in relation to how they might sound for you on a pair of speakers. And then something else that this also means, this being that I've heard some of these albums before in yesterday's attempt at recording, is that I'm going to fly through the first few albums quickly. It's not because I haven't paid attention to them. I did a full two hours worth of recording yesterday on these albums. I've listened to them thoroughly. But what I'm going to be able to do now is fly through them fairly fast, give you my impressions, but keep in mind I'm going to give you the impressions while listening to one track just to refresh my memory but I'll be talking about the entire album and then I'll slow down and take a bit more time on the albums I didn't get to yesterday. So as you can see on screen, we're starting off with Strauss's Also Sprach Zarathustra. As I said, I listened to this yesterday. It's a wonderful piece of music, but it's not actually a fantastic test. Let me take a really quick listen to one of the later tracks. The first track's that very famous introductory piece. You'll all know it if you take a listen to it, but I'm going to jump in a little bit just to refresh my memory and tell you my thoughts on the album. Okay, so what I really like about this album is that it's got a lovely sense of the spatial arrangement of the orchestra from left to right. Unfortunately, though, what I don't like so much about it is that you don't get a lot of layering and depth in the recording. And so, and when I say recording throughout this entire video, I mean the entire production of the album, recording, mixing, mastering, etc. So what you're getting when you listen to this particular recording of Alsace Sprach Zarathustra is you're going to get 
everything quite left to right. So your strings are over on the left-hand side. I should say your violins are on the left-hand side. Your cello's on the right. Obviously your violas and your second violin somewhere in the middle. But then when you hear sounds like the oboe come in, it's like they're sitting on top of the violins and the violas. And that's also true when there's timpani work and percussion work. Those should be at the very back of the orchestra. But what you actually hear when you listen to this album is they're kind of almost on top of the orchestra. Now, that can be great if you want to really connect with each instrument because it's right there, it's present, and it's available, but it's not so good if you're looking to understand the spatial characteristics of your system. So I'm not going to spend much time on this one. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about this album, it is a little bit muted sounding. So those of you looking for texture and resolution information, this isn't going to give it to you so much. For me, this is a great album to listen to and enjoy a wonderful piece of classical music. It's not so much a great test album because it's a bit muted and I don't think the spatial layout and information is as good as it could be. So let's move on to the next album now and remember I have listened to these in depth previously. I'm not giving them just a quick 30 second listen and giving you my thoughts. They had plenty of listening yesterday. Okay so this one was new to me. I'd never heard this before. Um, It's an opera. Some of the tracks on here are instrumental only like the I'm assuming it's an overture this first track. Actually yes I can see it there it says overture. So you can get some pure instrumental tracks such as the overture. Then there's some very dialogue focused tracks which are not particularly enjoyable to listen to. And then we also get some full choral tracks and some more solo operatic tracks and that means that you're getting a bit of a mixed bag from this album i'm going to listen to the overture again because that's pure instrumental and then i'm going to jump through i think it was to track three or four which is more of a solo operatic moment because those were the highlights for me from kind of a test track point of view the dialogue and the choral moments where everyone's singing that's not quite so good for me The dialogue moments can be a bit harsh, a bit thin sounding. The full choral moments, you don't get a great sense of space. Everything's kind of congested. There's too much going on all at once. But I do think the instrumental and the more solo operatic moments could be quite good. So let me have a quick listen, refresh my memory, and we'll talk about it. So this is kind of a good example, maybe not a great example, but a good example of what was missing from the previous album. And that is that as I'm listening here, I'm at the 235 minute mark in the first track. And there's strings playing in the front left of the stage. There's French horns playing as well. And you can clearly hear the difference in positioning of them on the stage. It's not a vast sense of depth that it's giving you, but it's giving you enough that it sounds realistic, it sounds natural, and you can clearly pick out the spatial abilities of your system. I'd also say that this recording has much better kind of textural information. So you can hear the bite of the uh, bow on the strings of the violins. You can hear how wonderfully smooth and rich and harmonic the uh, French horns are. It's a much more natural but also well-rounded sounding album than the previous one. I just think it's probably a little bit better of a recording. I wonder, and I haven't looked at this, but I wonder if Alsa Sprach Zarathustra was an older recording. It does sound a little bit mellow, a little bit muted compared to this one. So as I said before, I think the instrumental tracks are a great option for testing. I think there's better that it's going to come up in this in this video, but I do think it's not bad. And now I'm going to jump forwards to one of the operatic tracks and just talk about that. It's worth probably noting here that I'm not an aficionado for opera. I don't I don't go and see opera. I don't listen to much opera. So I don't really have a reference point for how it's meant to sound. I have played in orchestras. I used to play violin and viola. So I've got a very strong sense of how an orchestra should sound, both from an audience perspective, but also from the instrumental perspective, what each instrument sounds like. So for me, I don't have that same sort of reference point for opera. And therefore, I don't know how accurate the spatial setup of this album is. What I will say is that when you've got the solo vocalist in moments, I'm in track four at the moment at about the 345 mark, in this particular track, you can very clearly hear a lovely focused image of the main vocalist singing the main kind of um, storyline part, you could call it. And then when the chorus comes in behind them, there's a sense that you've got the the main vocalist, the chorus is kind of wrapped around behind them, and then the orchestra actually seems like it's a little bit lower down, a bit like it probably would be in a theatre where you'd have an orchestra pit for the orchestra, you'd then have the stage and all the action happening on stage. That's very much what it sounds like, but you do also find in this particular recording that the chorus isn't quite as well separated from the main singer as I would sometimes like it to be. And that could be a deliberate choice. It could be just a case of how they've done the recording. I'm not sure. What I would say, though, for me is that if I was using this for a test track, I'd be focusing on the moments where it's the solo vocalist and the orchestra, as opposed to those choral moments, which seem to just flatten everything out in the soundstage a bit. 
but it's a lovely recording. It's not music I'm personally going to be listening to because, as I said before, I'm not into opera, but a great recording, really nice recording. I can definitely understand why people might use it as a test track for themselves or a test album for themselves. Moving on now, and we're going to go to... Ah, uh, this was a really interesting album. So this is the, the called The New Four Seasons. When I first saw this, I thought, okay, it's another another recording of Vivaldi's Four Seasons, but it's actually different. It's been kind of reimagined that you can see on the screen there. It's called Vivaldi Recomposed. And what's happened here is they've merged electronic music with Vivaldi. And it's done very subtly. It's not like it's turned it into dance or anything like that. But there's some electronic bass, a few other electronic sounds, kind of supporting the, the violins and the other stringed instruments. It's done in a really interesting way, though, and I think the thing that makes it kind of fall apart for me is the way it's been spatially mixed. Instruments appear in places that I don't expect them to be. I don't think they should be from a naturality point of view. And that does draw back a little bit from it. Let me have a quick listen though, refresh my memory, and I'll talk more about the specifics. So this is one example, and there, there were a few when I did the listening yesterday. This is one example. I'm in track five, which is uh, summer movement two. And the, I'm at about the 2 minute 37 mark. What I'm hearing is there's this wonderful, rich, deep electronic bass that gives a foundation to everything. And that's one area that I think this album is really good, is if you want to hear the full range capabilities of your system, I don't know if it goes down into sub bass necessarily, but you do get a wonderful sense of the bass presence that your system can provide. And then you've also got all that texture and clarity of the upper registers of violins. So there's lots of good kind of tonal content, resolution content here. But where this one falls down a little bit for me is the spatial content. And what I mean by that is, I just said I'm at, uh, I'm in summer part two, which is um, track five. I'm at the two minute 37 mark. And what I'm seeing is that, or hearing I should say, is that there's the main violin kind of lead part, which is right up close in the stage, not in a bad way, just kind of really well focused forward of everything else. And then the cello that's playing along behind that violinist is actually just to sort of just behind them and just to the left of them. And it's really off-putting. If you think about a normal string quartet type of setup, which is what Vivaldi normally is, normally you've got your violins left to right. So you've got your sort of first and second violin, your viola, and then your cello. But here, the cellist is actually kind of really close to the violinist, just off to the left, and only a little bit behind them. And so spatially, it sounds like they've recorded each instrument in isolation, or at least they've recorded them together, but very close mic so they can separate and avoid catching sound from each other. And then they've just placed it where they want in the soundstage. And that to me makes it sound a little bit artificial, a little bit unnatural, and it does distract me from the listening experience. It's a really nice album. I look forward to listening to it from a musical point of view, just from a pure enjoyment point of view. But that spatial kind of playing around with things that they've done is a reason I wouldn't use it overall as a test album. Having said that, it might sneak into some of my dedicated test playlists. So for those of you not aware, my Patreon members above a certain tier, I can't remember which tier it starts at, I think it's called the enthusiastic tier. From memory, for enthusiastic above, or maybe it's passionate and above, you can find it all on the Patreon page. But for certain levels of my Patreon members, they get access to my curated playlists. And those playlists are broken down into things Things like resolution and detail, the ability of a system to do the transients and the, the treble attack of things, bass presence, bass extension, etc. So some of these albums, or some of the tracks on this album, I should say, could fit into some of those very specific focus playlists, but this album overall wouldn't make it into my test albums playlist, if that makes sense. I think it's got specific things going for it, but it's not an overall winner for me as an album. So this one to me is a wonderful suggestion. This album combines some electronic elements. So again, you can get that really full range, kind of deep present bass that electronic music can provide. It's again, not dance related. It's very much a classical album, just with some electronic instruments. And what's also great about this one is it's got this wonderful focus on the solo violin. It's all beautifully recorded with the soloist. You then also get things like on this track, we're up to track what I'm up to. I can't see the track number. It, the track is called Plan and Elevation for String Quartet, and it's the first part of that. And it's just got this wonderful quality of recording that you hear all the texture, the fullness of the instruments. It's spatially laid out really nicely where the string quartet, unlike the Vivaldi recomposed that I spoke about just a moment ago, this one is laid out in the more traditional way. So it kind of makes sense as you listen to it, things are where you expect them to be, and it can therefore help you understand what the system you're listening to is doing with the spatial cues of the music. 
And so this album, which is called LYS, for me is a fantastic recommendation. It gives you great tonal qualities, great resolution in the recording, so you can hear lots of details and textures. And then the spatial information is spot on as well. On top of that, as I listened to it yesterday, it's a wonderful musical album as well. So from an enjoyment point of view, it's really high up there for me as well. So this one's great. This one's probably going to make it into my test albums playlist. I'm going to wait and see. I haven't finalized that decision, but it's right up there as some of the best that have been recommended. Okay, moving on now to Hani Arani. I hope I've said that the right way. And this is the Live from Studio S2 album. This is just a fantastic recording of a piano. And it's done in a really interesting way where, first of all, you can hear all of the impact of the hammer on the strings of the piano. Then, of course, the resonance that follows. But what's particularly interesting, there are two things that I find interesting. It's somehow been a muted piano, so they've either used a mute pedal while they're playing this, or maybe it's an older piano where the hammers are a bit softer, I'm not sure. But either way, it's got this muted character to the piano that's very interesting. And then the other thing I really like about it, the way they've mic'd the piano, it's almost as if they've put the microphone inside the piano and they've got it set up so that all of your high registers go to the right channel, all your low registers go to the left, and obviously there's a transition point in the middle. And so it's actually like you're almost listening inside the piano right where the hammer's hitting the strings and i really enjoy that it's very interesting it's not exactly a natural listening position but it's very enjoyable and it could be a very interesting test to give you a sense of how your left to right separation of your channels is going what the crossovers like between them for say a set of speakers are you getting a nice midpoint image in the center of all of that it's just a very interesting overall album with great texture great tone and interesting space Moving on to track three now, which is leaving. I was just talking about track two previously, by the way. Moving on to track three, it's less enjoyable for me as a test track. And the reason for that is you've got this really interesting microphone placement and mixing of the piano with that sort of full range left-right spread within the soundstage. But then you've also got a vocal that's kind of sitting out in front of that. And so all of a sudden it does start to throw some really interesting cues to your brain because your brain's used to hearing a piano coming from one location and a vocalist coming from another. And now it's almost like both of them are happening all inside the piano because of that kind of piano setup with the full range left right sound so it's interesting the vocal is beautifully imaged it's beautifully sort of separated from the piano so from that point of view it's really good but the actual placement of everything is a little bit unnatural a little bit artificial so it's going to depend on whether that works for you or not i think overall for this album i would rate it as a good test album it's one of those as i said i don't think i'd use it so much for the spatial kind of accuracy of things so much as the ability to separate sounds but more importantly tonality you've got really full range music here from bass all the way through to treble you've got the transient attacks of the hammers hitting the strings of the piano you've got the richness and the resonance of the piano there's lots going on really really good in a lot of ways just not spatial accuracy from a naturality point of view but i think everything else is going for it beautiful album and really good to listen to as well this album really impressed me yesterday in my first listen. So the things that are going on here and what we're talking about here for those that are not watching the screen, this is the uh, Elgo Cello Concerto album by Sheku Kana Mason. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful recording of some wonderful music. And what specifically sets it apart for me is a few things. The cello itself is wonderfully recorded. There's a great sense of kind of detail and texture. There's the fullness and the resonance from the cello body as well. What's really nice is sometimes when you hear cello recordings, it's like they've deliberately tried to pick up all the sounds from the cellist, things like their breathing and general little movements. And you get a hint of that here, but it's not like they've tried to overplay it. And I really like that. So you do get the sense of the breath patterns and the movement of the cellist playing, but it's not like that's the forefront. The cello is absolutely the forefront. And I really appreciate that. Going on from there though, what's fantastic in this recording is that you get a very clear sense of the cellist in their place in space out in front of the larger orchestra, and then the rest of the orchestra stretches back out into the rest of space. So there's a wonderful sense of depth and layering, lots of detail, accurate tonality. It's just a really, really lovely presentation. From memory, I think it was this album, and I'm not going to go hunting for the track, but I think this album was the perfect kind of contrast to Also Sprach Zarathustra earlier. And what I mean by that is that I think in one of the tracks on this album, there is some timpani work. And that timpani work in this recording sounds distant from you. It sounds like it's way over the back of the orchestra, which it is and it should be. 
Whereas on Also Sprax Zarathustra, it was right up in front of you. It was like, as I said before, all of the instruments were kind of piled on top of one another in a straight line at the front of the stage. And so I really like the fact that some of the horns, the timpanis, some of the other percussion sounds distant on this album, as it really should. So I really like this one, highly recommend this album for anyone looking for a classical test album and or just a wonderful recording of some wonderful music. I'm going to move past this one fairly fast. It doesn't make the cut for me as a test album. The reason for that, and I should say we're talking about the uh, Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances Symphony No. 3. It's a live recording with the Philharmonia Orchestra. And the reason it doesn't make it into the kind of test album level for me is that whilst it's beautiful music and it's a lovely recording, it's again one of those that doesn't give you the spatial information that I'd like. So things like I've just stopped, I'm in um, the second movement, the Adagio Manon Troppo, the part one of that one. And what I'm finding is that the, sorry, and the track itself is actually the symphony number three in A minor. The, the point that I'm up to at three minutes, 19, there's a flute playing. The flute sounds lovely. It's beautifully focused in space, but it sounds like it's hovering directly above the violins. And that's not right. It's not where it sits in an orchestra. And so it does throw off the spatial cues. And that generally is true. I'm, I'm picking out that one particular moment. But that's true for the whole album is that, as I said, it's beautiful to listen to, sounds lovely. It's an album I look forward to just enjoying, but it's not one that I'd use for testing because of that sort of spatial compression, that lack of depth and that lack of layering. So I'm going to move on from this one so it's not to chew up too much time. I'm also going to skip the next one, which is the Jazz Orchestra Radio uh, album. Um, what's it actually called? Let's quickly start it to see what it's called. So the album is called Jazz Orchestra Radio by the Jazz Orchestra Radio, um, and it is more of a jazz album, so I'm going to skip past it. it. It doesn't fit the bill for classical music. It's an interesting recommendation. I look forward to listening to it separately, but I'm going to skip past it now and just focus on what really fits the bill as classical albums. And the next one is an absolute winner. So this one, let me get it started so you can see the cover. This one is just a beautiful combination collection, I should say, of Baroque tracks. It uses both an orchestra, but also a lead violinist. It's got an incredible sense of attack and texture on the strings. There's some really interesting violin techniques being used here that you can hear all the detail. I don't recall the track now, so you'll have to go hunting for it yourself, which will be fun in itself. There's a track, I think it's pretty early on, where the lead violinist here, who I'm assuming is um, Nic Nicola Benedetti, She's using some sort of technique where the, the bow is obviously bouncing rapidly across the string deliberately, and it just sounds magical the way they've recorded it. You can hear all the texture of the bow kind of biting as it hits the string each time. Really, really nice. So let me just listen to a tiny bit of this track, and I'll remind myself of the other things I liked about this album. Okay, so what I really liked here was that the violinist, the solo violinist, is clearly separated from the rest of what's going on. You've also got the wonderful texture of a harpsichord playing. You've got the kind of rhythmic, transient attack of those very gentle plucks that a harpsichord does on the strings because a harpsichord works quite differently from a piano. It's not a hammer hitting a string. It's actually plucking the strings. And so it's got this wonderful mixture of textual information, tonal accuracy. You've got good spatial cues with the separation of the violinist from the rest of the backing instrumentals. It's just a really nice combination and wonderful music too. If I had to find one negative about this album, um, I'm now in Violin Concerto in D major, um, movement three, the Allegro. And what I've noticed is that the when everything's going on, it is quite a wall of sound. So you're not going to get a lot of depth in terms of the overall soundstage space, but everything's well separated with depth. So what I mean by that is that the maximum distance between you and any instrument isn't particularly great, but everything still does have its place within that depth that's available. So it's really nice. It's a little bit of a wall of sound, but still with some layering. So I think a great album, beautiful music, beautiful recording. Just It would have been nice to have a bit more space, but maybe what we're actually hearing is the space they recorded in. It might have been a smaller kind of location, a smaller space they were working in. It's hard to know. But overall, really nice album, one to check out. All right, rolling on now, and we're now getting into territory that I actually haven't listened to. So these are going to be first-time reactions we're about to get. And I don't know if we've got a full album here. There's only two tracks that have come into the playlist. We'll have to see. Ah, oh, it's an 11 CD thing. Okay, scrap that. We're not going to play the whole album. Let's go back to the playlist. So the, the particular piece that I've been recommended here, let me just open it up. So what we're listening to specifically, what was recommended was that um, we've got Symphony Number no. 13 in B-flat minor, that's the Shostakovich composition. E, the recording that we're listening to is a Decca recording of the concert. I've got no idea how to say this one. 
the Concert Cabo Orchestra, I'm guessing, and the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And it looks like our conductor is... Is that the conductor? Is Bernard... I'm just trying to see where it says it. doesn't say. I'm guessing the, the conductor is Bernard Haytink. So that's the album that's been recommended. I haven't heard this one before. Let's take a listen. All right, so I'm four minutes 20 into the first track. And one of the things I do like about this is you've got a lot of the brass and the woodwind playing and things like the, um, there's probably the trombones that were just blasting pretty hard and you get that raspiness at the edge of the notes. What's really cool here is you can actually hear that kind of bouncing off the walls and coming back to you. So you're getting a wonderful sense of the space in the room. I'm yet to hear the strings come in and I'm not sure if we're going to hear a good sense of layering because the horns do feel quite close given where they probably should be in the layout of the orchestra. So I'm going to be interested to hear if we get the layering, but I'm loving the tonality. I'm loving the, the sort of textual information, those raspy horns, the ability to hear the space that they're playing in. That's all really good so far. Okay, so I didn't realise this was an orchestra, uh, sorry, an, an opera, I should say. The This is a wonderful opera recording. I think it's probably a little bit better than the one earlier that had the shotgun barrels on the, the front cover. This one actually is giving you a wonderful sense of depth, layering, separation, even when you've got the whole chorus as well as your main vocalist, as well as the orchestra, everything's got its place in the mix. This is a really nice recording. I can definitely understand why somebody would choose this one. It's not an album I would probably choose to listen to for enjoyment, but I can definitely see using it as a test album. Yeah, so both tracks of this one for Symphony No. 13 I'm really liking what I'm hearing. There might be more to this album than just these two tracks, um, but I think this is giving us a good sense that the recording is fantastic. It gives you a wonderful sense of space. There's a lot going on in the mix that you can kind of pick out everything in space. As I said, it's not music I'd probably want to listen to myself from an enjoyment point of view. That's just me personally, but I can definitely see it being used as a test album for space, tonality, image focus on those vocalists. Really, really good, really enjoyable. So let's see what's up next. This looks like some more modern contemporary classical potentially. Let's have a look. Oh no, it's Debussy. This is another one of those recordings that for me, it's a lovely recording, it's lovely music. It just doesn't quite have the layering that I like to hear personally in a test album. And keeping in mind, I'm looking here for albums that I can specifically understand a system with. This is not about whether it's a nice thing to listen to, it's about whether or not it's giving me insight into my system. And this album for me doesn't do that so much. It's a lovely recording in general, tonally it's lovely, it's giving a nice sense of the placement of all the various instruments within the orchestra from a kind of left-right point of view, and even a bit of height there as well, but I'm not getting the depth that I'd like to hear to properly understand what a system's capable of. So nice album, not a test album for me personally. So this one's just a beautiful piano recording across the board. Um, it's just solo pianos for the tracks that I've tried, at least it's just all solo piano. Um, we're talking here about the Chopin ballads, Baccarole and Fantasy, and it's being played by Christian Zimmerman. And what I would say is that the, the sound, generally speaking, is very clean, but not overly enhanced. It sounds like you're in a room listening to a piano recital, and it's really nice in that regard. Um, what's kind of cool is you can very gently and quietly at times hear little movements like obviously when the, the pianist when Christian Zimmerman's been getting prepared to play and he's just shifted his weight a little bit or maybe he's just moved the pedal with his feet you can hear those tiny little sounds but again they're not over enhanced they're not it's not like anyone's trying to be clever and push those details forward but on a good resolving system you're going to be able to not only hear those sounds but also pick out where it's all happening in space so I really like that another reason I like a solo piano recording is that a piano is a very difficult instrument to produce effectively if the system's not very good. And what I mean by that is it's often something I use for IEM tests. So IEMs, when, when they're tuned in such a way, or closed headphones too for that matter, when they're tuned in such a way that they've got big dips anywhere in the frequency response, because a piano is an absolute full range instrument, you'll very quickly hear any troughs or any cutouts in the music, you'll hear any peaks, because the tonal consistency will be off from the piano. So I really like it for that purpose. This is a beautiful recording, beautiful music if you're into Chopin, which I am, and I think it's a really lovely recommendation as a potential test album. So I'm gonna park this one here, there's not really much more to say, really nice, let's have a look at the next track. So we're now into Mahler's Symphony No. 8, specifically it's the Berlin Court Orchestra being conducted by... I can't tell who the conductor is. I think it's Pierre Boulez, or Boulez, depending on how you say it. Um, I think that would be right. I think he'd be the conductor based on the, the cover and, and the information. There's a lot of names mentioned there that I'm guessing some of them are soloists. I'm not sure. So 
the thing that I'll draw out immediately from this one is dynamic range is huge on this recording. So your quiet moments, your loud moments, there's a really big range based on what I'm hearing. Uh, as for the quality of the recording in other ways, I'm yet to find out. So this is really nice. We're getting a lovely sense of depth. It's not a hugely deep sound stage, but there's enough sort of sense of layering that it's clear that there is some depth. And in particular, I'm up to at the moment, I'm listening to uh, Symphony Number no. 8 and E flat major, part one. So it's actually saying part two, according to Rune, and then part one is the actual title of the track. What was the track before? Let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm not really clear. I got distracted then because the music started again. I'm not really clear. They're both named part one, but this is the um, this is the Allegro movement, which is the second track of the Symphony Number no. 8 in E flat major, it seems. But anyway, the key point here that I was going to make, and I've lost my timestamp now too, but the key point I was going to make was that in this particular track, there's a moment where the flutes are playing and then there's strings plucking and they're very clearly in a different place in space. And I really like that. The flutes are a little bit higher, they're a little bit further back. The violins feel a bit more forward, a little bit lower and off to the left. Really, really nice spatial placement. The clarity, the textual information is there. The fullness is there as well. There's some really deep kind of underlying sort of menacing notes from some of the deeper instruments in the orchestra to give a, a foundation and attention to the music and it's coming across really nicely. So I can definitely understand why this one's recommended. I'm going to skip forward, try just a couple of other tracks before we move on to another album. So I'm now up to, uh, I don't know what track number we're into. It's part 12 within the symphony number eight in E flat major, I should say. Um, and it's the final scene from Goethe's Faust, um, part two, apparently. So what I'm hearing here, we've got the choruses in this piece as well. So we've got chorus, we've got orchestra, and there's wonderful separation. You can hear that the orchestra is further back. So the, the chorus, I should say, is further back. And then things like the quick blast of the horns sit just forward of that, but still behind the strings. So as I said before, the sense of space and scale isn't massive, but the sense of layering is sufficient that you can clearly understand what your system's capable of in terms of layering cues, spatial cues left to right. There's all the tonality you could want and dream of here. There's good texture. It's just a fantastic recording. So really good recommendation again. All right, moving on now, and I think we're probably nearly done here. So, so for those of you that are still watching, thanks for sticking around. Okay, we've got a living stereo recording here. These are really interesting. I've got a few of these in my collection. They're somewhat artificial, but also kind of enjoyable in a lot of cases. Let me see. I haven't tried this one before. This is um, Zorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. Um, so we're going to have a listen and, and see how it goes. By the way, the version is, it's the living stereo recording. from an, It's an RCA Victor recording. Um, it's Fritz Reiner with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Let's have a listen. Okay, this is quite a lot like some of the other living stereo recordings that I've got. And what I find is the mixing of them is really unusual. The, the spatial sort of variation in the recording is great. You hear different things coming out of different places. That's fantastic. Where things go wrong for me, though, is that they put some of the instruments in really unusual places. So there was a French horn, no, not a French horn, a tuba at one stage, I think it was. And it sounded like it was kind of more to the left of the orchestra and quite forward in the orchestra, which it probably shouldn't be. The, sp the spacing and the placement of the strings compared to the horns and the woodwind isn't quite right. It's like they're on top of each other one once again. And it's kind of strange because there's lots of space in the recording, but it's like that space has been used in ways where they've manipulated where the instruments are in space rather than giving you that natural sense of kind of the sound of the orchestra starting at the front and cascading backwards depending on the placement of the instruments. So... I'm not a huge fan of this one, I don't think. I'm going to give it one more track just in case, but I think this is a no from me. So this is a great example. The, the track I'm on now is the Marketplace at Limoges. I'm guessing that's how it's said. Um, we're 18 seconds in, and straight away what you'll be hearing if you listen to this is that the violins are high left to start with, and I don't know why they'd be up higher than other instruments, but they are. And then it kind of goes down to the right for the lower um, did I say violins or strings? The violins are top left. The cellos are actually down and to the right. And then when the big crash cymbals come in, those are up there right next to and probably on top of the violins. So this is where it doesn't really make sense to me. It's like they've played with height and width, but they've placed instruments wherever they want to place it in the mix rather than having it natural. So that throws me off a little bit. It's a beautifully clear recording. I love the sense of interest it produces in the sense of space. And so from that point of view, it's a fun listen. And that's why I've got some of these recordings in my collection, but they're not recordings I generally use for testing. So I'm gonna move on from this one, I think. Interesting album, um, very fun to listen to, not a great test for me. 
Let me just see what we've got left here. We've got about four albums left, so we're just going to push through. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope you're enjoying it. Let me know in the comments if you are. And on that note, let me know in the comments if you've really enjoyed this and you want to see it again. Do you want to see me do it with a different genre? And if so, which genres would you like to see it on? All right, I'm going to be really quick on this one, and that is that it's not an album I'd use for testing. Uh, and the reason for that is that the soundstage is really narrow and tight. It feels a bit congested to listen to. I'm not getting a sense of scale. It's quite in my face. So probably a lovely recording to listen to. I haven't listened to a lot of it. From a musical point of view, it's probably nice. And by the way, what we're talking about here is um, James Levine or James Levine conducts Brahms. And it's just a little bit too kind of closed in and, and narrow for my liking for a test album. Again, sitting back, pair of speakers, just enjoying the music. It's probably beautiful, but not a great test album for me. So I'm going to move on pretty fast from that one. I'm going to skip the sound score as well. We've got Star Wars in here as a, as a film score. I'm not going to count that as classical in the sense that it, it is a film score. It's designed to go with the film. And so if anything, I might do a separate review or separate video, I should say, on film scores. So let me know if you'd like to see that one. Put in the comments down below if you'd like to see a film score video. Don't bother suggesting tracks down there. I can't keep track of them there. If we do go ahead, if you say that you'd like more of these videos, I'll put out other surveys where I can actually collect the names of the albums that you'd like to hear and that you'd like to see me react to. So don't put the tracks down there or the albums down there. Just tell me what genres you'd like to see and I'll send out a survey later. Okay, so we've got Hania Rani um, making another appearance here. She was the one that did the live from Studio, Studio S2 earlier. She's back again here from somebody else that's recommended this album. Let's take a look. This is from the Inner Symphonies album. I've just had to listen to a bunch of tracks here. I think it's, it's a really interesting album. For those of you that like sort of slightly exploratory but still very accessible music, I think this is lovely. Beautifully recorded in a general tonal and clarity sense. I'm not liking the sense of space available. All of the instruments are operating in a fairly narrow, tight band. It doesn't feel congested like the, the previous Brahms one, but it still doesn't give me a sense of the full scale of width in the soundstage or even depth because it is quite a, it's quite an intimate overall presentation. So nice music, nice quality of recording, not one that I would use as, as a test album though. So I'm going to move on from this one fairly fast as well. All right, so we're now up to Bruckner's Symphony Number no. 8. Um, this one's being conducted by... Who is the conductor? I'm guessing it's Maris Janssens. That's the main name on the title cover. Anyway, let's have a listen. You can see on screen the album, and it's in the playlist as well, if you want to find the exact one. So this has got a lovely sense of scale to it. In the, sorry, not scale so much as range to it in terms of the... Um, tonal ranges, there's a good sense of body, there's all of the, the high end from the violins, but there's also this wonderful sense of body from the cellos, the double basses, some of the horn section. Having said that, I'm not liking the spatial setup of this one. It's very left-right, so again, the horns are kind of sitting on top of the cellos as I'm hearing them at the moment. I'm in uh, 4 minute 50 mark of the, the scherzo, and it's really not giving me a lot of sense of depth and layering in the sound. Nice sounding recording from a tonal point of view and a clarity point of view, but it doesn't have that sense of depth. Yeah, so I've just tried another track. I'm now in the... So we're still Symphony Number no. 8 and C minor. We're in the finale of that one. 7 minutes 17. You've got the French horns playing. You've also got the string section playing. And it's like the French horns are actually sitting above the strings. There might be a tiny bit of depth there and a bit of bit of distance backwards towards the French horns, but it's not enough to give me a really good sense of what a system's capable of. Again, none of this is to say it's not a good album, not good to listen to, but from a testing point of view, it's not one that I'd choose. So we're finishing off with a really interesting recording here. So this is um, the Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number no. 2 in C minor. It's uh, performed by, I'm going to butcher this one, I hope or not, it's Katya Buniatishvili, I'm guessing, um, with the Czech Philharmonic. And what I'd say about this one is it's the, the quality of the recording in terms of the clarity, the tonality is lovely. The piano in particular sounds spectacular, but that's also where the problem comes in for me. And that is that in this recording, the piano sounds way too big, particularly through headphones. And this might be slightly better if you're listening to speakers because it's going to sound more like the piano is kind of closer to you and everything else is out behind it, hopefully. But particularly on headphones, it just sounds like you the piano is, is this massive, great big thing and almost like the orchestra is performing inside the piano because of the scale of the piano. So I'm not so much a fan of the spatial and the layout of it, but I'm very much liking the tonal qualities, the clarity of it. That's beautiful. I'm just going to listen to it a little bit more and see if I can get my head around it a bit more. Yeah, so I totally get why they would have mixed it this way from an enjoyment listening point of view. Absolutely fantastic for that. Lovely album, really enjoyable to listen to because it's got this 
really upfront sound for the piano, which obviously is the solo instrument here. So it's great for that. What I don't like so much from a testing point of view is that, again, it sounds like the orchestra is in the piano as you listen to this. So really fun to listen to, great music, but just not a great test album. So I think for me, there's probably three or four standouts from here that I'm going to come back and think about adding to my curated playlist for patrons. In the meantime, of course, you can check them out too and add whichever ones you like to your own libraries of both great listening albums, but also test albums. And as I said before, if you've liked this approach, then let me know down below what you'd like to see next time. Which genre would you like to see? Would you like me to filter it down and just talk about the ones that I think are great? Or did you enjoy seeing the full list and my reactions to all of them? Let me know down below in the comments. I'd love to hear your feedback and I'll keep adjusting the tune up to make it new and different each time, hopefully. But for now, I'm going to sign off. Thanks for watching this far. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please hit the like button and subscribe and ring the notification bell if you haven't already. But for now, let me leave you to the music. So happy listening and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.